seeing Singa. And uh, <coughs> it's a very, he, he asked me why I should invite him to give a talk, and uh, you see, and after you understand by yourself. So. No, no, I think I, I think I think he ran out of interesting people. <laughs> so, but Didi, uh, Didi, thank you very much for this invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is the second time that I've uh, had the opportunity to to speak in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, lecture hall, and uh, I tell you what, when you when you come from. Uh, a university or a faculty like mine where we work with immortals and uh, come into this um, into this empire it's really depressing okay it's really depressing but I'll try to stay stay happy long enough to give my talk okay the talk is about endosymbiosis and the origin of eukaryotes and the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I, I need to say it now, so one of the main messages that I will be trying to convey is that there is lateral gene transfer, lots of it, among prokaryotes. But among eukaryotes, inheritance is vertical. And this message has not come across yet I think in the literature, we're trying to do it, okay? We're, we're trying to establish the case that, yes, there's, there's lateral transfer among prokaryotes, vertical inheritance in eukaryotes, but in the transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, it was endosymbiosis, and this involves wholesale fusion of genomes. So it's kind of complicated. We'll, we'll see what we can get there. Okay, so this is the group. This is the group. This is the bioinformatics group. We're a very small group, very international. Uh, Nador's from Mexico. Sri Ram is from India. Felipe is from Portugal. Shiju is also from India. Mayo is uh, a German. And Chuan is from Taiwan. And you will notice that they are all smiling here. And do, do you know why they're smiling? It's because we have had a really good year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, I always tell my students, I say, look, we've had great publications this year. It's never going to happen again. So one thing that's very important when you have a really good year, it's very important that you tell everybody about it, because otherwise nobody will notice. So we've had a really good year this year. And uh, we're very grateful to, there's, there's a, you don't, you don't work in a vacuum, okay? You, you work in, science is, is um, has hidden structures, there are referees, there are for your papers and referees for your grants. And so whoever's here and was involved in that, thank you very much for not rejecting us the first time. Okay. So what do we want to do? Let's try a movie. Let's try a movie and see how, see how this works. Um, so what is this? This is, this is an idea that I had about uh, 15 years ago now, or 16 years ago, for the origin of eukaryotes, that the, the origin of eukaryotes involved a symbiosis between a methanogen, a hydrogen-dependent hemolithoautotroph, something that you will be very familiar with. Uh, excuse me. Ah, did it wrong here. Excuse me. Um, and a hydrogen-producing bacteria here. These are little, uh, these pills are symbolizing glucose or sugars. A heterotroph making molecular hydrogen as an end product of its facultatively anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic syntrophy, hydrogen transfer from a hydrogen producing bacterium to a hydrogen dependent archaean. This is the host that acquired the mitochondrion. And uh, in, in one version, maybe it was a methanogen, but definitely a hydrogen producing bacterium. And then my favorite term, endosymbiotic gene transfer, <coughs> the transfer of genes from the endosymbiont to the host, bacterial genes in archaeal chromosomes, giving us a chimeric eukaryotic nuclear genome, engulfment or surrounding in, in, in uh, the establishment of this uh, cell as an endosymbiont, transformation of the archaeal lipid synthesis to the bacterial lipid synthesis, that was the red to blue transition we just saw there, 
and then uh, proliferation of <clears throat> bacterial genes within the nucleus. Actually, the, the animators here were supposed to make these blue genes as introns move around and generate uh, this transition from group two introns of the symbiont origin to spliceosomal introns in the, in the eukaryotic nucleus. That, we think, is the origin of the nucleus. I can talk about that. They didn't do that. They said that would cost another 2,000 euros. And, uh, <laughs> and to, to get a proper nucleus, they said, would cost another 5,000 euros. So what they did here is they gave me a golf ball. All right, it gets the, it gets the point across. The, the main point is that we start with a mitochondrial symbiosis, a symbiosis of two prokaryotes, and the nucleus comes later. So what we're saying is that we start with symbiosis, and then the uh, attributes that distinguish eukaryotes from prokaryotes, like the nucleus or the uh, endomembrane system, the flagellum, those arose in uh, those arose as a consequence of mitochondria, not as a prerequisite for their origin. So the theory was called the hydrogen hypothesis, and one of the one of the main predictions of that theory was that it should be possible by a symbiotic association in nature to transform a methanogen, or a strictly hydrogen-dependent chemolithoautotroph into a facultatively anaerobic heterotroph. That was one prediction. That was wild at the time. Seemed crazy. Well, let's take a look. We've got a lot of genomes now. See how crazy it really is. So can we, can we test that? Let's go back here. So, in the meantime, a lot of so one of the predictions was right, the, this kind of physiological transformation from a hydrogen-dependent autotroph to a heterotroph is possible. Another prediction was that the eukaryotic host lineage, the, the host that acquired the mitochondria, would branch from within the archaea rather than as a sister to them in the uh, traditional Carl Woese tree. And another prediction was uh, rampant genomic chimerism in eukaryotes. There were also some other predictions about hydrogenosomes and facultative anaerobes. We won't get into that today. All of those predictions have been fulfilled. Today we know that the, uh, the modern, modern phylogenies have eukaryotes branching within the archaea, the host lineage within the archaea. So that, that part of the theory goes. It was radical in, uh, uh, 16 years ago, has been borne out by data. So hold on to the theory. Don't let go of a theory too early. Okay, sometimes the data will come around to support it. And uh, also the, uh, the, uh, um, the chimeric nature of eukaryotic genomes has also been borne out. Uh, this is a nice review by James McInerney and a nice review by, by Martin Emily here, uh, demonstrating, uh, supporting that case. So the, the, uh, the hydrogenosomes and anaerobic mitochondria that turned out to be okay. The position of the host as branching within the archaea, that turned out to be okay. Genomic chimeras in the eukaryotes, that turned out to be okay. What about the physiological transformation? Okay, so if we're, before we get into that, let's keep an eye on this here. This is, uh, this is very important. This is the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes in terms of genetics. Okay, this, this message has somehow not gotten across in the literature, and I don't know why. It's, it's in basic microbiology textbooks and in genetics textbooks. We should know it, but I'll have to repeat it here. So this is the process of evolution, genome evolution, or gene evolution, among prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are clonal. And if they don't have recombination, then there's a process <coughs> called Muller's ratchet. Muller's ratchet uh, says that if you are clonal and you do not have recombination, then you cannot remove slightly deleterious mutations that will accumulate in your genome to give you genetic load and you will go extinct. Right? There's basically no way around it. So Muller's ratchet is a, is a general principle that dooms clonally non-recombining organisms to extinction. Now, how do prokaryotes go around Muller's ratchet. How do they avoid Muller's ratchet? Well, they have mechanisms of recombination. These mechanisms of recombination are conjugation, plasmids, transformation, naked DNA uptake, um, and uh, 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 transduction with phages. Okay, you also have uh, uh, 
uh, gene transfer agents and some specialized mechanisms, but those in the main are the mechanisms. Importantly, the mechanisms of recombination in prokaryotes are from the outside, they are from donor to recipient. recipient. They are never reciprocal. There is never reciprocal recombination among prokaryotes. It's always from donor to recipient. It's unidirectional. And furthermore, the, um, uh, the, the, the products uh, are just transferred clonally. So the lack of reciprocal recombination is important, the unidirectional nature. And it's not even between organisms of the same species. Plasmids can go across any borders. Transformation is just DNA in the environment. And transductionism, of course, has there's no context between the, the donor and the recipient. The phages are just in the environment. So there's no real donor-recipient. Uh, so what this leads to is, as uh, how, uh, Roger Milkman referred to it, the process of recombination overlaid upon clonal growth. And what this gives you in the long term is lineages that have increasingly different co combinations of genes, collections of genes, pangenomes. Please, everybody here who has heard of pangenomes, please raise your hand. Not very many, I'll have to explain it. Okay, what, what happens in pangenomes? Just a second, and we'll come to pangenomes in a second. These are, these are eukaryotes over here. So that's prokaryotes. Clonal lineages with increasingly divergent collections of genes. Some genes come in and some genes go out. This is eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have sex, we have gametes that fuse, form zygotes, right? and then they produce, uh, during the life cycle eventually, more gametes that fuse again, produce more zygotes. And recombination, they avoid molar interaction via sex, recombination, homologous recombination, and reciprocal recombination, giving rise to lineages, okay, vertical lineages. This here gives rise to a vertical process of inheritance, and this does not. What are pangenomes? If you take 61 species of E. coli and sequence 61 strain, no, it's not species, strains of, uh, of a single species of E. coli, and sequence their genomes, what you will find is about 8,000, 18,000 genes, okay? 18,000 different genes distributed across 61 genomes. Average 4,500 per genome, there are only 1,000 genes that are common to all 61 strains. That is the core genome. The rest is called the auxiliary genome. It comes and goes. So that when you compare uh, two average E. coli strains, they will share about 40 to 50% of their genes, right? depending upon how closely related the strains are. And, and um, so the, the main thing is, is that this core genome is very small, only 1,000 for E. coli. For humans, it's different. If you sequence 61 humans, you will get exactly the same genes. You might have a little bit of copy number variation, but we don't have this variation, right? So pangenomes in prokaryotes are a big thing. Eukaryotes don't have them. This is lateral, this is vertical, and this has been going on since the beginning of time. So, all right, physiological transformation. Halophiles, something that PDA, uh, PD likes. Okay, these are, these are halophiles as the salterns and uh, in, in Spain, we're looking at uh, a bacteria rhodopsin, which is a, a, a protein that the haloarchaea have that they use uh, to perform photosynthesis in these uh, salt-saturated brines uh, in the salt manufacturing process. Now, halophiles are <coughs> going to be a test case for, our, for the theory that it should be possible to transform a, uh, an ana a strictly anaerobic hydrogen-dependent autotroph into a heterotroph. If we look at the phylogenetic trees of halophiles, the haloarchaea have always been branching within methanogenic ancestors. Okay, so halophiles are, have a physiology that is almost identical to our mitochondria. They are heterotrophs, they live from sugars or fats or proteins, they have a respiratory chain in their archaeal uh, plasma membrane, and they uh, can use oxygen as the terminal acceptor. Okay, so heterotrophic aerobes branching within hydrogen-dependent chemolith autotrophs and methanogens. Okay, now how did that transformation take place is the question that we're asking with genomes. Is it a case for gene transfer, or is it a job for point mutation? 
let's let's vote for gene transfer. Let me close this door here. Excuse me. Okay. I think it's gene transfer. Let's take a look. So what we did is we collected a bunch of genomes. We started looking at large numbers of genomes and trying to get a picture of the genome evolutionary process, a picture that you can print on a DNA4 piece of paper and see it and look at it and understand it. So what this is, is a collection of 65 archaeal genomes compared to 1,000 bacterial genomes. And the elements of the matrix in each case is a little tick. And the color of the tick indicates how many genes those two genomes share. Now, how do you determine how many genes two genomes share? In order to do that, you first have to sort all the genes in all these genomes into clusters or families. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a program to, that allows you to do that if you have large computers. It's called the MCL clustering algorithm, Monte Carlo method. And what it does is it takes, you take an all-by-all -all blast, and let's say you have a, a million proteins, right, in your, in your genomes. And yeah, say you have a thousand genomes with a thousand proteins each, gives you a million proteins, you do an all-by-all -all blast, that's a million proteins versus a million proteins, that's 10 to the 12 elements in your matrix. And you have all the pairwise comparisons, and then you pull that matrix apart until it falls into natural categories of sequence similarity. Then you have your clusters, and then you can count how many clusters are shared in each individual genome comparison. What you can see here is that there are some lineages of, halo, of, of archaea, like the Methanosarsenales, or the Methanomicrobiales, or in particular the halophiles, that share lots of genes with different bacterial groups. This doesn't tell us which genes, it just tells us which bacterial groups share genes with archaea. Most archaea are fairly poor in bacterial genes and some are fairly rich. Now we're not looking at everything right now, let's just look at the halo, at, at the halo files. Now this next slide I think cuts a long story short. And what we did is the following. We took all proteins that were shared between halophiles and bacteria, which was about um, 8,000. And then we looked for all of them that, were, that um, had at least two halophiles in the data set and at least five bacteria in the data set. And we made trees for everything that we could make trees of. And we found a thousand proteins in the halophiles where the only archaea that had the bacterial gene were the halophiles. And furthermore, the halophiles were monophyletic in the tree. That is, we've got a thousand, about a thousand genes in the halo archaea, where the halo, the halophiles have a bacterial gene. No other archaea has the gene, and um, and the halophiles are furthermore monophyletic. That looks for all the world like acquisition in the common ancestor of those halophiles. We looked to see what kinds of genes those are. If you look at the functional categories uh, distributed across the 10 halophilic uh, genomes that were represented, obviously it's mostly metabolism because that is what, uh, that is what uh, microbial evolution is all about. It's about metabolism, it's not about regulation or, or morphology, it's metabolism. And in the main, it's amino acids, carbohydrates, energy production, it's heterotrophic pathways of accessing energy, okay? That's what the halo files do. Now, what's very important here is to see that um, some of these acquisitions are very unusual, are of very unusual nature. This is a picture of the um, respiratory chain in these archaeal halo files. <coughs> this is complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four. And blue means that the gene is present. Uh, purple means that it's uh, it's borderline, and white means that it's uh, white means that it's not present. Now, what this indicates is that okay is, is actually very important. Methanogens do not have respiratory genes. The ancestor from which the halophiles arose do not have respiratory genes. The halophiles do have this respiratory gene. It furthermore operates in the ether lipids. Yeah. Of the, of the archaeal membrane. 
And furthermore, these, these halophiles have also acquired the genes from metaquinone biosynthesis to generate the, um, the, the lipid-soluble carrier that transports electrons uh, within the electron transport chain so that these can respire. Now, this is evidence for mass acquisition, not for piecemeal acquisition. Why is that? Because if these genes came in one at a time for complex one, right? Let's say you get new OBs transferred in. It will come in, it will sit in the genome, it will mutate, and it will be lost, right? Prokaryotes do not tolerate genes that they cannot use. Individually, these genes are useless. It's only functional as a unit. And that's not only true for complex, it's true for the whole respiratory chain. So this is actually a very strong argument that this transition from, from methanogenic ancestors to halophiles involved a symbiotic association of some sort where you had whole chromosomes or whole chunks of chromosomes coming over to facilitate this radical transformation in physiology. Right, we published that in PNAS in, in, uh, in 2012. And uh, in the meantime, we were looking, you know, what about all that other red stuff out there? So we went a step further. <clears throat> and we took all archaea that we could find. This was now 75 archaeal genomes. We made our clusters again. Okay, we clustered all the, all the genes in these 75 archaeal genomes, it, and that gives us a total of 25,000 clusters. Okay, now what we're looking at here, for the rest of the talk, we're going to be focusing on a new kind of figure that you've probably not seen before. These are gene distributions. Okay, these are 75 archaeal genomes. Each tick here is a family, is a gene family. We've got about 16,000 families here. Now, you can see, okay, that's, there, there are about 4,000 families here that are specific to the halophiles. And what we're looking at here, we're looking at the 16,000 archaeal genes that do not have bacterial homologs in our data set. So we've got 2,000 2, bacteria in the data set. We've got uh, 75 archaea. And there are 16, uh, of the 25,000 genes total, 16,000, two-thirds, do not have any homologs in bacteria. Now, what do these gene distributions say? We've got 4,000 genes here present in the archaea, and in no other species, no bacteria, no archaea. The main component of variation in gene distributions in prokaryotes is lineage-specific. This is a very unusual observation. And it's rather new if, in terms of, I mean, people have known this, but we've never had pictures of it. This is amazing when you look at it. You've got genes that are densely uh, uh, present in the group, and then many that are less densely present. These are either laterally transferred or present in the ancestor and differentially lost. And um, so these are the genes that are present in only one archaeal group. Over here, we've got the genes that are present in two archaeal groups, okay? Ideally, these present in two archaeal groups would give us some kind of branching pattern or evidence for a more phylogenetic process within archaeal evolution. None. There is, there is no pattern in these two groups that would link any of these groups together. So what we, have, we have evidence for the reality of the groups, but no evidence for the process linking them in an evolutionary process. And, um, you know, I've been talking about lateral gene trans for a long time. Didi has too. The opponents are saying, look at the don't look at lateral transfer, look at the tree of life, okay? Look at the ribosomal proteins, the backbone tree of life, because that tells the story. Now, do you see this black line over here? Those are the genes, it's 70 in this case, that are present in all archaea. It's basically the ribosome translation factors, and that's it, all right? That is what I call the tree of 1%, all right? Now, it's phylogeny does not predict, right, what the rest of the district, what is going on in the rest of the genome. It will recover the groups, but it does not give us any clue as to what sorts of genes um, uh, those groups contain. So the tree of 1%, or the backbone tree, is what everybody has been looking at because it's the easiest thing to look at, and it's actually turned out to be very difficult to generate pictures of like this with all genomes, but we found a way to do it, and we're seeing interesting things. now. Let's look 
at the genes that the archaea share with bacteria. All right? You see this basic pattern here? We're going to see it repeated over here. It's the same groups in the same pattern, but now these are uh, 2,000 prokaryotic genomes down here, here condensed to the uh, roughly 20 groups, major clades from which they, uh, from which they stem. And here you can see that the ticks indicate whether the gene is present in the group, not in the genome-wise. This is genome-wise and this is group-wise. And what we see <coughs> is the following. Let's focus in on the halophiles again. Again, we've got here about 2,000 genes in this, in this analysis that the halophiles have. They share these genes with diverse bacteria and with no other archaea. Not only is that true for the halophiles, for all these other archaeal groups, we have genes that are present in the sulfalobales in no other archaea and widespread among bacteria. Now, we can do a test. There are several tests that you can do to, to uh, examine whether these, these genes were acquired one by one by a lateral acquisition or whether they were acquired in the common ancestor of the group as these dense distributions and thinning out by a loss would indicate. And for half of the, of the groups involved here, there is uh, a strong case can be made that the genes were acquired in the common ancestor of the group and then lost. And what that means is that the origins of major archaeal clades correspond to gene acquisitions from bacteria. Okay, this is, a, this is a view of evolution that is not based in point mutation. It's not based in individual gene acquisitions. It's based in mass acquisitions. And that these gene acquisitions correspond to the origin of major groups. Okay, it's a somewhat radical, uh, radical view, but it's not that radical. And for the halophiles, it really fits the bill. Okay, the talk was supposed to be about eukaryotes, so let's get to eukaryotes. All right. Oh, let's not worry about this. That's, that's not important. Let's just get back to this. Lateral gene transfer is important in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, uh, inheritance is vertical. But we've got chloroplasts and mitochondria in eukaryotes. And there's no question that those correspond to endosymbiotic events and that also there were gene transfers involved. So let's see if we can make these same kinds of gene distribution studies cluster eukaryotic genes into families and see whether we can get a handle on the gene distributions uh, behind eukaryotic genomes and what's going on there. So this we have here 55 eukaryotes. All right, these are plants. These are photosynthetic algae that have plastics of secondary symbiotic origin like diatoms, brown algae, uh, and cryptophytes, and down here we have animals and fungi, and here in the middle we have some protist groups. Uh, here the uh, Entamoeba and Dictyostelium, or over here Trichomonas and, and its relatives. So we have 55 eukaryotic groups. If we do all the gene sequences of eukaryotes, it's a total of about 20,000 different gene families, and half. Uh, uh, no, excuse me. It's 15,000 uh, gene families in total. And here we have uh, 12,000 of them uh, that are eukaryotic specific without prokaryotic homologs. <coughs> now, if you might, you might recall that in, in the archaea, almost 90% of the signal was lineage specific. Here in the eukaryotes, it's quite different, this, these distributions. We've got a big chunk of genes here that correspond to uh, the origin of the plant lineage. And here are a big chunk of genes that are uh, specific to the algae. We have a few genes here that are shared with plants and algae. And then the, the, these chunks over here. But the, many of these, uh, these patterns down here, they provide more evidence for phyletic relationships between the groups uh, than we saw in the prokaryotes. That's also interesting. And that's not terribly surprising because inheritance in eukaryotes is vertical, all right? So what happens now if we look at the genes that eukaryotes share with prokaryotes? And we're going to see this a little bit. Uh, I thought it was very exciting. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can get excited about a black and white figure. I got excited about a black and white figure. Um, so what, what, what's happening here? What's, what's up here? All right. 
It's kind of complicated. Let's take it slowly, um, but it's, it, it might be exciting. Here are the plants, okay? These are plants. These are land plants, red algae, cyanophora, green plants. These are algae like diatoms and, uh, and uh, cryptophytes and, uh, and uh, brown algae. Here are the am animals and fungi over here. All right, now let's, let's just focus in on this big block of genes here that is shared by the plants and unites the plants with the, with the secondary uh, derived, the, the algae with secondary plastids. Remember, the algae that, with secondary plastids, they acquired their photosynthesis not directly from a cyanobacterium, but they swallowed an alga. And actually, you can see that imprint here in these gene distributions. I, I must say, for every distribution we see here, all the way down to the prokaryotes, we have the phylogenetic tree as well. Okay, we have the, it's not only the gene distribution, not just the families, but also the alignments in the trees are in this data. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So what this, what this shows is that these gene distributions actually show clearly this, the shared genes that are shared by a secondary symbiosis. The, uh, these algae acquire their plastid, and then genes are transferred to the nucleus. And furthermore, if you look down among the prokaryotes here, you can see this big dark, you can see that big dark line here, right? Now, what group of prokaryotes do you think that might be? It has a big chunk of genes shared with plants and algae. Any guesses? Can anybody read? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's cyanobacteria. It's endosymbiosis. You can see it. I like to say you don't even need to manipulate the data. Now, when I gave this talk in, uh, in California a few months ago, somebody from Cambridge said, uh, Dr. Martin, did you adjust the uh, contrast in your, in your paper here to get back? Okay, now I know how the Cambridge people do their bioinformatics. They do Photoshop bioinformatics, right? No, no, there is no adjustment here. We did not increase the contrast. It, these are cyanobacteria. You can see the signal in the data. You can see another signal down here that links prokaryotes to eukaryotes. These are the genes that are universal among the eukaryotes, very widely distributed, definitely present in the common ancestor, and shared by a funny little group of, of uh, prokaryotes down here. They are the archaea. And what is this? This is the ribosome. DNA uh, uh, maintenance machinery, it's the genetic apparatus. But do you remember in the, in the old ribosomal RNA tree of life that you can still see in some textbooks, the three domain tree, eukaryotes are sisters to archaea? Look at it. It's a minuscule signal. It's 20, if you do the trees, what you find is that 20% and less of these genes in eukaryotes actually trace to archaeal. And in fact, uh, to our kale answer, in fact, half of the signal that eukaryotes have altogether comes from cyanobacteria and the plastid. A, a minor fraction comes from archaea, and this down here, we will argue, comes from mitochondria. So what we have is evidence for endosymbiosis in these genomes. Okay? And uh, it's also just very interesting to, no to notice these distributions. They look very much like, you know, common asset and then thinning out, okay? So how could these, these, these are called patchy distributions. Some of these genes are present just in a few eukaryotes and in no others. So the question is, are these acquisitions at the origin of major eukaryotic groups or are they lineage specific acquisitions like many of the lateral gene transfer stories for eukaryotes would have us believe? Well, first of all, let's look a little bit at what the trees say. Like I said, those are, those are 2,800 um, 2, gene families where eukaryotes are shared, shared genes with prokaryotes. And in each case, we, looked at, we made the alignment and we looked at the maximum likelihood tree. And then we asked which prokaryotes are in the sister group of the eukaryotes at a frequency that is higher than that expected by a random distribution of leaves on that tree? And the answer is, we find three groups of prokaryotes that are significantly overrepresented in the sister group to eukaryotic genes. And those are cyanobacteria, that's this here with a very significant signal. Those are alpha proteobacteria down here 
the red dots, with also with a very significant signal. And in, among the archaea, there are two groups, uh, both from the Uri archaeotes and the, and the Crean archaeotes. That's probably just a, an artifact of, uh, of the, the small sample size that we have. Um, uh, it should only be one host lineage for the origin of, uh, of uh, there we go. Uh, it should be one archaeal host lineage. This is just uh, the, the, the small, uh, an artifact in the small number of uh, archaea sample. There are no contributions from other proteobacteria that are significant and no contributions from other bacteria. What that means is that there are some versions of endosymbiotic theory marvelous version that had the spirochete being an endosymbiont, or other versions having chlamydia having to do something to do with plastids, or other versions having delta proteobacteria being involved in eukaryotic origin, or other versions having uh, planktomycetes being involved. There's no evidence for any of those. What we find in this data is evidence for a minimalistic version of endosymbiotic theory with plastids, mitochondria, and an archaeal host. Now, <clears throat> Let me see, where are we going here? Uh, right. You can uh, look at the, now this doesn't come up well enough. Let's just skip that. Um, let's ask, how often are the eukaryotes actually monophyletic in these uh, 2,800 trees? And the answer is, they're monophyletic in 75% of the trees. In another 12%, the eukaryote uh, monophyly is not rejected in the maximum likelihood ratio test. Um, but if you look at the prokaryotes, they are very seldom monophyletic. For example, the alpha proteobacteria are only monophyletic in 10% of the trees. What does that mean? That means that bacteria, alpha proteobacteria, exchange their genes with other prokaryotes. And that's why, because of lateral gene transfer, um, what is an alpha prote a gene in an alpha proteobacterial genome may be a recent acquisition, and therefore the, the alpha proteobacteria are not a monophyletic group. Right? The, the prokaryotes are seldom monophyletic, and that just simply reflects the process that I showed you before, gene transfer among prokaryotes versus vertical inheritance in eukaryotes. Another way to examine that is we take these 2,800 genes that are uh, defined the uh, 55 eukaryotic lineages having uh, homologs and prokaryotes, and say, well, okay, this is the, the sample of genes if we look at eukaryotes, this is the sample of genes in the prokaryotic world that they share with prokaryotes, all right? That's 2,800 genes. Now, what happens if we ask, if we use exactly the same methods, and for example, take 55 strains of E. coli, and ask how many um, genes do these 55 strains of E. coli share with other bacteria? This is sort of like asking the pangenome question. And the answer is, E. coli is here, you can't see it very well on this projector, but it's, uh, it's 5,000 genes. And what we can say is that 55 strains of E. coli, strains of the species, have sampled prokaryotic gene diversity twice as thoroughly as eukaryotes have in 1.6 billion years. What does that mean? It means that eukaryotes do not have a continuous distribution, a, a continuous uh, exchange of genes with prokaryotes. They are isolated. Okay, they are isolated. They don't exchange their genes with prokaryotes. They did at the origins of organelles, but not since. Prokaryotes have these huge pangenomes because they are continually exchanging genes in the environment. Eukaryotes are isolated. Now, that's this process again, trying to get that message across. Last question. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Dr. Martin. Are we, are we missing something here? Look at this set of genes here. This is present in um, Dictyostelium and Entamoeba, basically, okay? And it's present in no other eukaryotes, and it's present in lots of prokaryotes. Doesn't that look like lateral acquisition? It really does. Yeah, it really looks like lateral acquisition. Recent lateral, lineage-specific tip acquisition. So does this pattern here, and this pattern here, and this pattern here. But, okay, so, so there are two possibilities. Either these are lineage-specific acquisitions, or the process of differential loss has affected, is responsible for their being lost in all these lineages. That is, they were present in the ancestor of these genes, just like these were here, but then they were lost in all these other lineages. Now, is that possible? 
Well, let's look at the predictions. One of the predictions would be that if these genes are recent lineage-specific acquisitions, or these, or these, or these, or any of the genes around the tip, they need to be more similar to their prokaryotic homologs than genes that have a root distribution. So we tested that, and this is, this is the data. The, the blue lines are the tip distributions, and the red lines are the root distributions, that is the widely distributed genes. What we're looking at here is the average uh, sequence similarity between these genes here and their prokaryotic neighbors in maximum likelihood trees. Now, if these genes here are recent acquisitions, they should be more similar, that is, uh, shifted to higher levels of identity than the red genes, but they're not. The blue, the, the tip-specific and the root-specific distributions uh, are identical. They cannot be statistically distinguished. That speaks strongly in favor of differential loss uh, being the cause of these distributions. But can that really be true? Um, Think about it. Loss is an irreversible process. When you lose the gene, it's lost, and that loss is inherited vertically throughout the, uh, for the rest of evolution, and you never get it back. Okay? So loss is what's called a dollo process in evolution. You lose the gene, that, that loss is uh, vertically inherited since. If a gene can be lost in one lineage, it can be lost in other lineages as well because it's not essential, right? So if you lose it in one lineage, you can lose it in others. And if differential loss is governing these patchy distributions, then there's always going to be one lineage that is the last one to have it. Right? There's always going to be one last lineage in your sampling. And the last one out always looks like an LGT. So what we really, we, uh, we can make a strong case that uh, it's actually differential loss uh, governing these distributions. And these, uh, are, are on their way out, and uh, there's, there's always going to be someone who's the last one out, and the last one out looks like an LGT. So that's that paper that appeared this summer. That's the group again. And I think, I think basically I'm done. There's, there's one, thing, one thing that I forgot to mention, and that is that we've got a test for verticality. We can test whether the genes that um, uh, eukaryotes share with prokaryotes tend to come in uh, uh, at the common ancestor or whether they uh, came in, for example, in one lineage of eukaryotes and then were passed around to generate uh, monophyletic trees. The test involves comparing uh, the, tr the tree sets for eukaryote-specific genes versus those that are acquired from bacteria. If those tree distributions are similar, that is, if the trees are drawn from the same distribution statistically, that's strong evidence that the genes came, on, came in in the common ancestor. If the genes came in in one lineage and then were passed around, the trees would be very different. We can also uh, have evidence for the origin of these genes corresponding to endosymbiotic events uh, from that test. So again, that's the group. Um, these, this is the team. Some people say these are the people who still talk to me. Well, Dee Dee still talks to me, so that's good. Uh, and, and some people say, these are the people who have to talk to me because I pay their salary. Um, these are the people who fund our research. And thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions. That's it. Thank you. It's very uh, impressive. But uh, as you know, we, we always work on exceptions. So okay, exceptions. I'm listening. Uh, there is one very, there is one beautiful uh, example of uh, massive gene transfer from uh, bacteria to, to uh, animals, uh, which is uh, Wallachia. Wallachia. Yes. yes. Uh, that may be huge in some cases, 60% of the genome. Uh, there is other things. That yes. There is, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly agree with, with you on, on prokaryotes as a general thing, but it's not true for virus. So that there is lateral gene transfer from virus, okay. even in human space currently. So that, for example, there is purpose virus 6, that, that may be favorite in general, of course, uh, 8 okay. virus. Uh, okay. Okay. So right. there is virus. Right. And the same even for part of the giant virus, they may be integrated. Yeah. And, and the thing that you see in the, in the I mean, I get a different uh, uh, 
opinions because Ameda and, and, and Fabulous properties are very different, have a very different life of any others. Because one of the reasons why you cannot exchange genes is probably because you are isolated. But it's not the case for the phagocytic uh, uh, protists yeah. who <coughs> have plenty of DNA from bacteria. Okay. 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 Can, can I respond to that? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. okay. So, so, so let, let's do several examples. In the, so, yes, in the, in the paper, we, we list the, uh, there are uh, clear, ca clear cut cases of gene transfer from prokaryotes to eukaryotes in recent. The Wolbachia case is one that we cite. It's a, a, about a million base pairs of genome, right, in the, in, uh, in, in, in insect, uh, in insect chromosomes. And there are also cases of the uh, uh, placental specific uh, genes that were acquired from viruses, very important in placental evolution. There are cases, okay, but generally they are rare. Now there are also cases of uh, what we don't have in this analysis is we don't have the singletons, right? So there are many of the many of the reports in genomes where we you know you get these big flashy claims for for lateral gene transfer. They're present in one genome, right? Now, many of those could be contaminations. Many of them may be short-term residents. But the, the, to, to quote, because we're familiar with this and we know this, right? To, to quote the abstract, I think the final sentence of the abstract is that lineage-specific acquisitions may occur, but what we see here in the families, they do not contribute to the overall process of eukaryote genome content evolution, okay? So they, they, they might be ephemeral or otherwise, you know, uh, present in one lineage and then, and then they get lost or maybe, uh, I, I also think that many of the um, lineage specific cases that people have looked at um, and claim to be lateral gene transfers, we've looked at such uh, distributions like this, there are also some of trichomonas, these are probably differential losses, okay? Because none of these lineage-specific acquisitions that turn out to be real are, re are, are very highly similar to, to prokaryotic homologs, or if they are, then they tendentially turn out to be contaminations. So we've got the, the, the phagocytic, phagocytic protus. This is, goes back to Ford Doolittle's 1998 paper, You Are What You Eat. Um, and the prediction, okay, remember, the prediction of that model is that these, all these genes in, in eukaryotes that <coughs> do not specifically branch with, mito, with uh, alpha proteobacterial homologs, or in plants do not specifically branch with cyanobacterial homologs, these are lateral acquisitions from, uh, you know, eaten bacteria. If that were true, then very important, different lineages of eukaryotes should have fundamentally different collections of genes, just like we see it in prokaryotic pangenomes, right? If this continuous acquisition is real, then we need to see it in, in, the, in the overall picture. That is, different lineages of eukaryotes should have very different collections of genes. The only case we see where different lineages of eukaryotes really have different collections of genes is the plants, and that corresponds to cyanobacteria, a symbiotic event. The rest of it is basically uh, goes back to the common ancestor and is due to differential loss. So we're making some strong claims here. And not everybody is going to, you know, sit down and, and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, you must be right. There's going to be some debate. But what, what we're doing here is we're turning it around and saying there's lots of evidence for vertical inheritance. One of the things is that with, with, uh, I think proteins are different, uh, LSD proteins are different, just because they get the opportunity to, to, to get this. And the other thing is that there is only, uh, I think there is only two genes of, of Akantabia. And uh, of course, you cannot see all the Akantabia about the lineage. Quite, uh, no, no, no. We're, it's just one. We're, 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 that's right, and we're making the prediction. But then again, did you think about it? You carry. Let, let's let's take the amoeba lineage. Let's take amoeba lineages. Let's say that amoebas have had a billion years, right, to collect genes. Isn't it strange that they've never changed their physiology? Gene transfer in prokaryotes is all about changing your biochemistry, right? Getting access to different niches different redox couples, different physiology. Eukaryotes have a completely uniform physiology. I've studied, this is what I've spent most of the last 20 years studying, the, the evolution of physiology in eukaryotes. You know, so anaerobic mitochondria, aerobic mitochondria,
mitochondria. They're, they're just, uh, they are differential sets from, from the same, uh, they're specializations from the, from the uh, same ancestral state. Another way of putting it is that in 1.6 billion years, mitochondria have never been improved upon through gene transfer. And so there may be something going on yeah, with the with the phag uh, with the phagocytotic protists, and there may be uh, acquisitions out there. At the same time, many of these acquisitions might turn out to be the, the the result of differential loss through further sampling. And if this is really happening, then different lineages of, of eukaryotes, including the protists, right, the, uh, or the ciliates, have to have fundamentally different collections of genes. So that's the prediction. And invite me back in ten years, and we'll see what it looks like. Okay, I, I, think, I think that if this process were really going on, we would see more evidence of it uh, in these well, genes. I, I think already if you compare the two, I can tell you that you, know, you don't find the same bugs in the trans that, that part of the transcript. One and so in the, in the last one that I've been sequenced, for example, we, we find the sequence of giant virus. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That were not the first. Uh, yeah. process. Absolutely. There, uh, every time you do a new genome, there are some, some new genes, right? And, and I do not doubt that they exist. But the observation is that they apparently do not contribute to the long-term process. Because if they get fixed, then they would have to be inherited, right? Well, yes. And this is what we... But you, 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 you cannot predict the future. So you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you can predict, but you can predict the genomes if you sample a lineage, right? <laughs> That's right. So, so, so you're right. I mean, what, what, what is true is that uh, lateral gene transfer has, uh, because we know it occurs in prokaryotes, it's, it's, been, uh, it's become very popular in eukaryotes, but the, 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 uh, the, the process over the longer term of evolution needs to generate something like the process of the, the, the different collections of genes that we see in prokaryotes, we don't see that. Yet. Nobody's ever looked. Nobody's ever looked. And therefore, it's surprising. But if you, if you look also, I think the, the bottom is history. For example, we, we work here since, since uh, 30 years yes. on, on intracellular affairs. Yes. Intracellular affairs have no have no, agenda, have no gene. They don't get it. No, they're, 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 it's purely reductive. Yeah. It, it, the intracellular yeah. parasites, yeah. They, they, they adapt to a rich environment, they lose yeah. genes. Mm -hmm. They get a little bit of, uh, if you, we just finished work with uh, uh, somebody today, we just finished work on a uh, <coughs> very interesting work on, uh, on the, the chlamydia film. Yeah. On the chlamydia film, uh, there is two very different situations that, that, that will explain, uh, well, as I, as I told you, I, I work on small different things, so mm -hmm. I'm bothering everybody. Uh, so if you look in chlamydia, they get exactly the figures that explain the problem. So, so if you look at those that live in, that are specialized in animals. Yes. These have few and all, I agree with you, uh, lateral gene from the chromatarms. Okay. They get, they leave there. So the only thing that they get is the targets. And they get genes from the targets. That's what they find. And if you look at these that live in Ameda. Yeah. They live with some data and they get plenty of genes that come from other bacteria. Yeah. Just because they eat the bacteria. So yeah. depending where they are. So, so when you are, as both are symbiotic, but so, so when, when you live in a, in a symbiote, as a symbiote in a place where there is no other uh, prokaryotes, you, you cannot keep any of the genes. So you, you, you live alone. And uh, the only genes that you can keep come from your host. So this, so this is like the, the, the insect and the symbionts, they are yeah. cut off from yeah. gene transfer yeah. from yeah. other insects. Yeah. And uh, they just undergo reductive evolution. Right? And, and it's, it's also the case that uh, eukaryotes don't have very much to offer that a prokaryote could use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, is, this is also kind of. What they do is. I wonder what you do with the eukaryotes that are not sexual, that are cloned up. Um, okay. Okay, this is really interesting. Go, uh, go ahead, please. No, no, I have nothing to say. <laughs> yes, you, have, you have a lot to say. What you're, what you did, what you're not saying is rotifers. You know? <laughs> okay, the rotifers are. Uh, now, when you, this this is interesting for for two reasons. Um, 
it, one is interesting because I submitted, submitted a paper last week to PNAS that is not rejected yet called uh, On the Origin of Sex. Now, the, the rotifers are, are asexual or they, they do it very rarely. Okay, so when we look at Muller's ratchet, right, going back to the Muller's ratchet thing, either the rotifers are going to go extinct or occasionally they recombine to save themselves. Now, I don't know the literature exactly. I've heard rep the rumors that there are there is evidence that they occasionally do undergo recombination. But they're basically asexual. What we do see is we do see evidence for Muller's ratchet. We see the, it looks like elevated mutation rates, it's high, uh, high frequency of uh, slightly deleterious alleles that they can't remove through recombination. So <clears throat> we see evidence from Muller's ratchet working in the for genomes. They also, there were also reports in the original science paper of high, uh, high amount of LGT. But I looked through that supplement, I could not find the data that indicated that. Okay. Good examples of the Transfer, not only from bacteria, yeah. from plants, okay. from fungi. Okay. And again, no problem with that. Um, uh, sure. If we're talking about, uh, this, this goes back to what we were talking with DD. Uh, if you have recent transfers, you have all of the, the, the individual genomes, they have some evidence for LGT. But it's, it's, it's not, in, it's somehow, it's, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't contribute to the overall process. So we've got lots of stuff going on in the tips, sort of like, um, sort of like you know, traffic. But it, the, it apparently, uh, as far as we can tell from the analyses here, uh, this process doesn't, doesn't give, give rise to long-term differences in gene content. So they do exist. It's a test for the situation. They don't have sex very often, not at all. They can't do it. They won't transmit anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so the, 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 the fact that we see these high, high rates of, uh, let's call it, let's, let's call LGT uh, a special case of a slightly deleterious allele, okay? And they can't get rid of it. I have no problem with that. I also would have no problem if we would see that the, the eukaryotes had lots of lineage-specific acquisitions, but that's not what we see in the data. And uh, I'm quite sure, okay, look, this is uh, for, the, for the young students out there, right? This is a Nature article, right? If we publish this in JBACT, nobody cares, right? If we publish it in Nature as an article, people are going to go out and write grants about it to show that we're wrong, okay? so. We have to get ready for some criticism. People are going to challenge us on this. Well, you know what? That's the way. That's the way science works, right? You 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 take the data and the interpretations, and in 10 years, in 20 years, if we're still alive, we will know more, and we will only be alive. If how many of you are doctors, or you're learning to be doctors? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Please study properly and accurately because someday I'm going to be on the operating table needing a good doctor. <laughs> and you need to know the difference <laughs> between my pancreas and, and my stomach. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so, uh, we're making some strong claims here. Uh, they're supported by the data. But never in evolution, or actually ever in science, do you have the last word, right? It's a it's it's a work in progress, and so what what this is, um, this is just taking because I I look I, I grew up with lateral transfer, right? My first paper in 1986 was about lateral gene transfer, and it was also about transfer from prokaryotes to eukaryotes and endosymbiosis. So I've been following this, and we, and we know that there's a there's a, a long tradition out there. But if the, um, the, these processes have to have cumulative effects, and, and what we've got here with these uh, clusters are the first way of looking at the gene. Do you, like, do you guys like these figures at all? Even though they're black and white? Yeah. Oh, you have great taste. <laughs> so that makes me feel really good. Okay, yeah, I, I like the figures too because they, uh, they, they show the genes from a different perspective. One of the things that I'd also like to say, shut me up and go away if you want. Um, is that what we've been looking at 
with the trees. The trees show us where the, which lineages have the genes. We've never been able to see where the genes are not, right? Who is missing the genes? And that's what these matrices show. We've also got the same thing for prokaryotes, for 2,000 prokaryotes. The distribution is 200,000 genes, more than half are lineage specific, and the others are very unusual distributions. Uh, we don't know how to publish them because the figures are that big. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I, I still believe it's little circular. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, think that's, I think that you, 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 you things are not going to stop now. It's just because we look at it. So evolution will continue. So we, we right. really have New, new plays, new way of living uh -huh. that are starting now and that will appear. It's, it's not appearing just once. So we, we don't know, but for example, I think uh, uh, you, you get uh, sugars, uh, enzymes that have been transmitted, that right? That have been transmitted from, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. Uh, they will use this. It's, it's, it's like for the same, it makes them to you. In some instances, this will confer an advantage Yes. Allow a new niche to be explored. Yes. And I would believe that within that niche, this will be transmitted for some time. Yeah. For, for, for example, one of the one of the referees, uh, for example, uh, criticizes with regard to the the red algal genome, Galderia, that had lots of reports of lateral gene transfer. They say, if you would include like Galderia in your analysis, you would see more lateral gene. It's in the it's in the analysis. Okay. So there's a, what what one of the things. Um, I, I'm trying to be open here, and uh, I, I want to sit down for a little bit. Uh, I'll move over here, where it's less likely to break. Um, uh, if, you, if we look at the genome analysis process as it occurs in the bioinformatics laboratory, right? I've done this for years. And, it, you have a genome, what do you do? You take all the sequences, you blast them, you find their best hits, and you make trees, right? And so what this gives you then is then trees where you have the nearest neighbor, and then very often it's confusing, right? Very often it's surprising, not confusing, surprising, right? And then it looks like that old gene transfer. I've got papers out there like that too, it's fine. But the, the, one of the things that I've thought about is that, man, if all this, you know, all these unusual branching patterns are real, they have to add up somehow. This is what, this is what Haldane and, and, uh, and Maynard Smith said, the numbers have to add up. There have to be cumulative effects. And that's what we see in prokaryotes with the pangenomes. We see these, these cumulative effects. And so we were looking for them in eukaryotes. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm asking more questions than I am providing answers, okay? So, uh, but an another thing that uh, occurs to me with con conferring selective advantage, let's look at our mitochondria. Talk about a junkyard, right? Our mitochondria are really degenerate. They've got all of these bad, uh, they're, they're on their way out, basically. They never recombine, they have all these, this high mutation rate, uh, lots of, uh, the, we have the extra the germline set aside in, the, in female development. To, so that the mitochondria do not accumulate mutations. All of these biological mechanisms generated to preserve our mitochondria. We have every opportunity for animals in general to refresh their genes to get, you know, better, let's say, rickettsial or chlamydial or any kind of respiratory gene, improve those. It doesn't happen. This is very interesting. Okay, it just doesn't happen. And, and this has to do with this, this barrier between the, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes that might be stronger than, than we previously have imagined. And, um, okay, I need to say something very important. I come from Texas, okay? So I'm probably a lot stupider than I sound. Okay, so don't believe everything I say. There, there's, <laughs> I'm probably doing so. I'm probably making some big mistake here, and we're going to find out about it. But, but uh, the, the, the thing about mitochondria, also plastids, they they never get improved upon. Yeah? The, the prokaryotes, they do they do um, have modular uh, evolution and, and replace copies, and and it, it doesn't happen so much in eukaryotes. This is also because eukaryotes have one physiology: heterotrophs, right? 
facultatively anaerobic heterotrophs in the plants and a cyanobacterium with autotrophs and then lose it. But well, I, I, it's the only thing I see in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, there is another way of, of uh, uh, reducing the amount of Genome duplications. Yeah. You never see it in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes regularly whole genome duplications. Everything is duplicated. You've got a, a, a whole new copy of everything, and this allows them a playground. And they do that all the time. And that's why the nature of of gene diversity in eukaryotes is gene families, not lateral gene transfer. Um, uh, in Paris, oh please, um, Edward Rocha. Uh, uh, has, a, has a great paper on that, that the, the nature of, of gene diversity in prokaryotes is LGT. In eukaryotes, it's gene families, right? And so, uh, and prokaryotes never have these whole genome duplications. They have this continuous transfer, or sometimes mass transfer. And we duplicate and, and modify it. We invent new genes all the time. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are lots of differences. And, um, and the, just this discussion shows and, bringing these differences to the fore is important. Yeah, and, and also think, I mean, the, the <coughs> fact is that there's a, a difference uh, that you see in the mouth compared to that what you see in, in bacteria. appear very, very small, but of course, they come up if you were talking about the synthesis of the retrovirus yeah. or, 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 or placenta, yeah. which interestingly happens several times. So, so, so there are uh, Didn't know that. two or three different uh, retrovirus that have mm. been uh, those that uh, ungulates, for example, no. different of, of, of the one we have. There is this other just came out also in National I think five months ago, but uh, the, there is one retrovirus which is the main difference between the eggs and us, which is uh, <coughs> which is transcribed or in the that that is also critical and for us. And, and this is also interesting. Um, and um, so the, the virus differences that we see in genomes, these are recent and uh, they can be dramatic in terms of the numbers of copies, but virus are very aggressive colonizers. It's, so they get in, they can multiply. Now the chance whether or not they get incorporated into something that's functional or not is a different story. Whether they add, make a new enzyme, rarely, because it's, the uh, metabolism is not the virus thing, right? So they're more about replication. But they're very aggressive colonizers. They get in and they can spread, and so they can have massive influence on the genome without maybe uh, generating as many new genes as they generate copies of themselves. So uh, this is also a, um, an interesting general sort of a principle that, uh, again, distinguishes the prokaryotes from the eukaryotes. The, uh, of course, we have IS elements that proliferate in bacteria as well, right? But uh, it's not, uh, they don't, um, it's funny that the bacteria are not colonized by retroviruses. Well, there, there is kind of. A, kind of, yeah, but not really. Go ahead, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, uh, first time, uh, no, but uh, in, in the karyot, you get outbreaks of intron. Yeah. It's the same as the karyot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is just, uh, there, there's lots of food for thought here. I think the, the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the, the Canadians, the Canadians. The Canadians are tending to uh, trivialize the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, whether it's Patrick Keeling or uh, Ford Doolittle or Andrew Rogers. They're saying there's some sort of continuum between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes, and that also the, the, the process of eukaryogenesis was a, uh, was a gradual process, gradualism. Um, I don't see that in Darwinian. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's gradual. It's not Darwinian. Darwinian says natural variation, right? Now, uh, in the symbiosis. Well, he say that he was gradual. Exactly. Yeah, well, uh, but also, I mean, Dar what was Darwin concerned with? He was concerned with everything that's visible to the naked eye. He was, Darwin was not concerned with microbes at all. Nobody had any idea that microbes evolved. What, what more microbes? It was completely inaccessible. Darwin, uh, his principles of natural variation and natural selection, they still explain 
all of the biodiversity that we see that is visible to the naked eye. It's just the, the processes in the microbial world. And that's the funny thing. It's amazing. Darwin really is amazing. Um, uh, that uh, the only uh, mechanisms that we've learned in, in the last 150 years that are fundamentally different from what Darwin had in mind are endosymbiosis and lateral gene transfer. But they're only important in microbes. And endosymbiosis is so rare, plastids and mitochondria, are once in four billion years each, okay? So it's rare events, rare events, but uh, that have corresponded quantum leaps, right, in, in organization. Whereas the prokaryotes have actually done this gradualist thing just with a different mechanism of natural variation in addition to point mutation that they're transferring a gene. So, so Darwin was right. Also, Lamarck was right with the CRISPRs, right? Required immunity. Okay. 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 Thank you.